Well, we are very excited to have Brother Mick with us here this morning. And to introduce his words of exhortation, he's asked that we take a reading from Numbers chapter 13. And I'll ask Brother Reuben to read that for us. Thanks. Well, time has come for us to listen to the exhortation in preparation for the emblems to come. And I'll love to ask Brother Mick to come up and share his thoughts with us this morning. Thanks. That will. So good morning, everyone. Um, it's great to uh, to be up here with you this morning, and uh, Nez and I bring with us the love and greetings from your extended family and our extended family at Castle Hill, who are meeting just like us around maybe a different looking table, but it is still the table of our Lord, and uh, it is a wonderful fellowship we can all share. Um, I'm sure I'm not alone when I say this, um, but I've always wondered what might have happened in the world if the children of Israel had actually carried out everything that God had commanded them after they came out of the land of Egypt. Right back as far as as far as far um, Exodus 23, I'll just read a, uh, a short passage from there. Well, actually, probably a lengthy passage. You might want to look it up. Exodus chapter 23, and I'm going to start from verse 20. Um, now, all of my quotes this morning will be taken from the ESV. So uh, for those who have got the uh, King James, I hope you can follow on quite, quite well. Exodus 23 and, uh, and verse 20, where God says, Behold, I send an angel before you to guard you on the way and to bring you to the place that I have prepared. Pay careful attention to him and obey his voice. Do not rebel against him, for he will not pardon your transgression, for my name is in him. But if you carefully obey his voice and do all that I say, then I will be an enemy to your enemies and an adversary to your adversaries. When my angel goes before you and brings you to the Amorites and the Hittites and the Perizzites and the Canaanites, the Hivites and the Jebusites, and I blot them out, you shall not bow down to their gods, nor serve them, nor do as they do, but you shall utterly overthrow them and break their pillars in pieces. You shall serve Yahweh your God, and he will bless your bread and your water, and I will take sickness away from among you. None shall miscarry or be barren in your land. I will fulfill the number of your days. I will send my terror before you and will throw into confusion all the people against whom you shall come, and I will make all your enemies turn their backs to you. And I will send hornets before you, which shall drive out the Hivites, the Canaanites, the Hittites from before you. I will not drive them out from before you in one year, lest the land become desolate and the wild beasts multiply against you. Little by little I will drive them out from before you, until you have increased and possessed the land. And I'll set your border from the Red Sea to the Sea of the Philistines and from the wilderness to the Euphrates. For I'll give the inhabitants of the land into your hand and you shall drive them out before you. What would have happened, do you think, if they actually did that? They actually went through the land. It would have been a horrible thing. I mean, just imagine. It was constant battle. It was constant fighting, and it's battle, nothing like what we're seeing over in Ukraine at the moment. This was face-to-face, hand-to-hand, blood everywhere. It was horrible. But they'd been told to do it, and they'd been told that God would be with them. What would the world look like now if they had have actually done that and carried out the commandments that God had, had given them? But as we all know, They didn't, did they? They listened to the words of fellow slaves like them. What would have happened if they had instead listened to free men, Caleb and Joshua, men who were no longer slaves? We read in that passage this morning, and I I must say, I'm sorry, um, I gave this exhort a couple of weeks ago at Camden, and the guy who um, got up to do the reading was only a young bloke, and I think it was his first actual reading. And I didn't say, don't do the first 16 verses. I promised myself and him that I wouldn't do that again. So that's why I had to change. So I, I too, was looking forward in a, in a really nasty way to, 
see how it would go, but I decided to, to, to not to, so that's good. Um, but it's, in, it's these descendants of Anak that we read about this morning that I'd like to consider this morning. Not really out of any interest in who Anak was, although if you look at Wikipedia, there is a little bit of information about who he may have been, but rather what they represent. The words, the descendants of Anak and sons of Anak, were used here to strike fear into the hearts of the children of Israel, weren't they? To instill in their hearts their total inability to prevail against them, these mighty people, that they were indeed unable to go up against them and wipe them out. Now, the people of Anak must have been absolutely horrifying. These slaves who had come out of Egypt even knew of them. They knew of their ferocity. They knew they were giants. They knew that these fierce warriors, these descendants of Anak, were worthy of all fear. Now we're told in a number of places throughout Deuteronomy. Um, hold on. Yeah, one point. Hold on. Hold on. Slide. Um, anyway, um, I'll just go from there. Anyway, we're told in a number of places throughout Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 2 and verse 10. The Emim formerly lived there, a people great and many and tall as the Anakim. In verse 22 of that same chapter, a people great and many and tall as the Anakim. Deuteronomy 9 verse 2. A people great and tall. Remember, this is Moses talking to the, uh, to the children of Israel just before they went into the land of Israel. A people great and tall, he says, the sons of the Anakim, whom you know and of whom you have heard it said, who can stand before the sons of Anak. Now, they were just ex-slaves, unproved in battle, let alone trained. There may have been a huge number of them, well over a million, but what could they do against these feared giants? After all, who can stand before the sons of Anak? That was the mentality. And it was being further hammered home to them that they couldn't stand against them and that they would be killed if they, tr if they tried. Their wives and children murdered, brutally murdered before their eyes. And in a sense, if we were looking on as one of the children of Israel and we had seen these Anakim and had heard these stories, the stories of their prowess in battle, and could well imagine it too. Surely we too would say, we seemed like grasshoppers, and so we seemed to them. Two men, however, men who had seen the Anakim and felt like grasshoppers, who had seen their great fortified walls, said, let us go up at once and occupy it for we are well able to overcome it. Because I've got no doubt that they remembered the words of Yahweh when he spoke to Moses back when they just come out of Egypt. Let's see if I've got this right. That's right. Here we go. Back on track. When my angel goes before you, he tells them, and brings you to the Amorites, and the Hittites, and the Perizzites, and the Canaanites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, and I blot them out. You shall not bow to their, down to their gods, or serve them, or do as they do. But you shall utterly overthrow them, and break their pillars in pieces. They knew, these two men knew, that they could overthrow them, because they remembered that God had said that he would send his angel before them, they remembered words like, I will send my terror. And I will send my hornets before you. I will give the inhabitants of the land into your hand and you shall drive them out before you. Everybody else in the group had seen the Anakim and that was it for them because none can stand before the sons of Anakim. That's it. Job's done. 
It's hard to refute or ignore what you can see. Because they feared what they could see, they had no fear or respect for what they couldn't see. Back at the Red Sea, they feared the Egyptians because they could see them coming towards them. A massive cloud of dust and all of these horses and chariots and, and countless soldiers and they knew they were going to be taken back into captivity. They could see that. And yet God said, trust me. But after all, who can stand before the sons of Anak? Now, for those who know me, um, there's probably not many of you, actually. Anyway, um, I've banged on about this quite a bit over the last few decades. Um, but it never ceases to amaze me that we humans can look around us and see so much proof, evidence of the power of God, and yet we don't trust that self-same power to help us. I asked in one of my recent exhorts at Castle Hill, um, what is it that confirms your faith? And I remember sending a text message to a lot of my, um, you know, my age group at Castle Hill. And um, what, I said, what is the one thing that confirms your faith? And they all came back with about three or four. Um, so I'm not quite sure whether that is not paying attention to my text message or they just thought, I'll, I'll ignore you. But at the end of the, the, ex the exhort, so many people, as well as, as all of my, my, my age group, came up to me and said, you know what? He's really not one. And it's so true. There is not one thing that confirms our faith. There is a myriad of them. And they're all come together to give us that solid foundation of our faith. And yet, we all, sadly, still feel this incredible urge not to trust God anyway. We don't leave it in God's hands. We don't let go and let God. He told the children of Israel to trust him and he would get rid of the Egyptians who were racing towards them. And yet they said, sure, we trust you, but we can see these Egyptians. We can't see you. And as we know, it was their children who finally left it in God's hands and allowed him to work with them. Joshua 11 verse 21. And Joshua came at that time and cut off the Anakim from the hill country, from Hebron, from Deber, from Anab, and from all the hill country of Judah, and from all the hill country of Israel. Joshua devoted them to destruction with their cities. There was none of the Anakim left in the land of the people of Israel. Only in Gaza, in Gath, and in Ashdod some remain. Children of Israel, from the ages of 19 and up that came out of the land of Egypt, took 40 years to know with certainty that they could leave everything in God's hands and trust him. How long for us? Each individually. How long for each of us has it taken to fully leave everything in God's hands and to trust him? Now, obviously, from here, there's really only one place to go, if you're following what I'm trying to do here. Anyway, there's only one place. Um, come with me to 1 Samuel, chapter 17. Um, and now, of course, here we have the, uh, the story of David and Goliath, the very well-known story of David and Goliath. And uh, I'll just start reading from verse 2. And Saul and the men of Israel were gathered and encamped in the valley of Elah and drew up in line of battle against the Philistines. And the Philistines stood on the mountain on the one side and Israel stood on the mountain on the other side with a valley between them. And there came out, sorry, and there came out from the camp of the Philistines a champion named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. He had a helmet of bronze on his head. And he was armed with a coat of mail, and the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of bronze. And he had bronze armour on his legs, and a javelin of bronze slung between his shoulders. The shaft of his spear was like a weaver's beam, 
and his spear's head weighed 600 shekels of iron, and his shield bearer went before him. Now, although it doesn't specifically say that Goliath is one of the sons of Anak, given what we read in Joshua a few moments ago, I think it's fair to say that he may well have been of that line. Now, ballpark. All right, ballpark. I'm about two metres tall. All right. Now, for the older ones, that's about six and a half feet tall. People take. Um, now, Goliath stands a full 900 mil higher, or three feet. All right? He's up here. That's a fair height. And there's a few tall people here. I didn't feel too out of place when I walked in the door, which was lovely, unlike Castle Hill, where we've only got myself and Rob. But, you know, that's a fair height. To be able to carry his accoutrements of war. Now, have a think about this. His bronze helmet, all, all bronze. Uh, his coat of mail, roughly 60 kilos in weight. Now, I'm 75 kilos. 60 kilos in weight. The armour on his legs, again, bronze. His javelin of bronze slung between his shoulders. His spear. A weaver's beam, it's, it's described as being. It's massive. Plus, it's got this massive head of iron, which, again, weighs six kilos. Not to mention his sword, because don't forget, shortly after this, David cut off his head with his own sword. So that was pretty cool, too. But I think it's fair to say that he would not have had my build. I'm basically bird boned. I. I I weigh nothing. I really do. There is no way that he would have been anything like me. He was a monster of a man. With this height and build, he also had the other benefit of being a trained fighter, a trained killer. He would have been a hard man, obviously used to getting what he wanted, uh, when he wanted it, and taking no backward steps. And then over there, on the other side of the valley, there's the children of Israel, huddled together in fear because they know who can stand for the sons of Anak. They know that with every fibre of their being, they'd heard it for years, it was known. David is a young man. He too would have been trained for war in a fashion as Goliath had. He too would have been a, a muscly guy, living outside much of the time. Yep. Uh, keeping his sheep safe, as we see later in, 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 uh, in the chapter in verse 34 and 37. Apparently a good looking guy. But you wouldn't look at him and think, there goes a giant killer. And here's Goliath, this mountain of a man, coming out each day taunting the children of Israel, ostensibly calling them craven or chicken, a spineless group of men with a spineless king hiding behind them all in the stuff. And so they were. Do you think that David, after he left Saul's tent, after trying on his armour and rejecting it, simply went down to the brook, picked his five stones and walked off towards Goliath. Can't really see that happening, personally. Not knowing the faith of this man. Not having read the words of his songs throughout his life. Remembering his words to Saul just moments ago about God being with him as he had been when looking after his sheep. I'm pretty sure he would have prayed as he was going down to the brook. I think he probably would have prayed as he continued to walk towards Goliath. I can't really see it happening any other way. How else would he be able to say with such confidence in verse 45 of this chapter here? Uh, put God. Then David said to the Philistine, this is after Goliath had said, you know, you come to me with a, with a, um, um, 
a stick. And David said to the Philistine, you come to me with a sword and with a spear and with a javelin. But I come to you in the name of Yahweh of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day Yahweh will deliver you into my hand and I will strike you down and cut off your head. And I will give the dead bodies of the host of the Philistines this day to the birds of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel and that all this assembly may know that Yahweh saves not with sword and spear, for the battle is Yahweh's and he will give you into our hand. Now I'm sure he wasn't just talking about the Philistines where he says this assembly. He'd sat there and he'd listened to his brothers and he'd sat there and he'd listened to the other men in the children of Israel in their camp as they sat there in fear, considering this giant of a man in front of them. Who's going to go out there and kill him? Can't. He's one of the sons of Anak. That all this assembly may know that Yahweh saves, not with sword, spear. And then he promptly does. Exactly as he says. The children of Israel, back when they saw the people of the promised land, and Joshua, when they saw the people of the promised land. Children of Israel's response when they saw Goliath. David's response. When he heard and saw Goliath, these three men had one thing in common an unshakable faith that their God was with them and that he would give them the strength to overcome their giants. And we all have giants too, don't we? Every single one of us. Not necessarily tall, broad and ugly either. But we all have things in our lives that we come up against that are huge and possibly insurmountable. There's no way we think that we can possibly overcome them because they are just so big. What is it for you? How are you? going to beat these giants. The man that we're here to remember this morning had a fair-sized giant that he was to come up against. That final night after the meal he had with his closest friends was an incredible giant. I don't know about you, but I, I know I don't have the strength to do what he did that night. Without a doubt, my fear would overwhelm me. He knew what he was facing, and yet he still walked on. Come with me to Luke. Uh, Luke chapter 22 and uh, verse 39, where we read... And he came out and went, as was his custom, to the Mount of Olives. And the disciples followed him. And when he came to the place, he said to them, Pray that you may not enter into temptation. And he withdrew from them about a stone's throw and knelt down and prayed. He must have been a wreck by this point, surely. Three and a half years travelling throughout the land of Israel, preaching and healing This was no sedentary lifestyle that he was leading. He was no TV evangelist with beautiful clothes and fantastic transport. The only time he wouldn't have used Shank's pony was when he was carried into Jerusalem on the back of a young donkey. And I can't help but think that wasn't comfortable. He would have been thin, tired and just plain old exhausted by by this point. Constantly with the Pharisees and the Sadducees at him. Constantly with the people thronging him to be healed and to see miracles. His closest friends just moments ago were arguing about who was going to be the greatest in his kingdom. 
And he's got this massive giant towering over him by this point. What does he do? I couldn't do that. Knowing what the Romans do, knowing what they will do to him, what an amazing man. What incredible faith. The children of Israel didn't believe in the power of Moses as God. And the emphasis there in the power of Moses as God. Deliver the, uh, to deliver them from their giants. Because they knew that none can stand against the sons of Anak. So they wandered in the wilderness and died. Never seen the promised land. Their children learned all about the power of their God and therefore were not afraid of the sons of Anak and so were ready when it came to fight their giants. Saul and his army saw and heard a giant standing before them with a spear like a weaver's beam and were already beaten because they knew they'd heard it. None can stand before the sons of Anak. David was too busy looking after his small flock of sheep, always aware of the power of his God all around him. So he took care of his giant, knowing that his God was always with him. Lord Jesus Christ, 